have never before seen a police officer almost break down in the witness box. So affected was he by the sight. You removed her from there and took her to a secluded spot where you violated and murdered her. More than 600 people packed the funeral home in Court Bridge to say goodbye to little Alicia, many wearing pink in her memory as her family had asked. First, we're going to start off with subscribers on YouTube. Um, I've fastly had a little breaking point in the middle of nine subscribers where I slowed down and didn't get very many subscribers. Something could have been done, um, that there could have been further action taken to make sure that this never happened. In the early hours of July 2nd, 2018, the body of a lifeless six-year-old girl was found in the abandoned Carls of Butte Hydropathic Hotel in Rothersay, Isle of Butte, Scotland, by a member of the public. A small manhunt had been underway after the young girl's grandfather had come to the realisation that she wasn't sound asleep in her bed, where only hours before her father had left her to fall asleep to Peppa Pig. But the circumstances surrounding the girl's death would prove ever more tragic as the details surrounding the case began to unpack and the monster behind the killing, an aspiring YouTuber, would be at the forefront of the investigation thanks to the help of his mother. This is the case of Alicia McPhail, the six-year-old girl murdered in a sad twist of fate on one summer's night in July. Just a quick disclaimer before we continue, this story contains details about child sexual abuse, so if that's something that makes you uncomfortable, then feel free to select one of the hundreds of other videos on the channel. As always though, thank you for your time, and let's get on with the case. To start this tale, we've got to travel roughly 55 miles from Rothersay into the heart of Scotland, Airdrie, a small town situated just outside of Glasgow. And on the 22nd of October 2011, Alicia McPhail was born to parents Georgina Lockrain and Robert McPhail. For the first couple of months, the family unit was strong. They were ready for the future. But as the third month swung around, the couple ended the relationship on relatively good terms. We don't know in-depth details as to why that was, but they stayed in touch with each other, so Alicia she would have a healthy relationship with both parents moving forward. Over the period of her short life, she would make trips every two weekends from Airdrie to Rothersay to visit Robert. When the pair had broke up, he moved back there to his parents' three-bedroom flat, and Alicia had her own little space within the property all to herself. She loved it there, trips to the beach, park, swimming were made, amongst other activities. She was always out and about, but if for whatever reason she couldn't go anywhere, she would stay inside and spend her time watching TV or YouTube with her father's side of the family. Back home in Airdrie, the trips were understandably not as frequent. I mean, she did go to Rothersay for short breaks after all, but Georgina still put the effort in and did right by her daughter. She made sure her attendance was 100% at school, any of her daily needs were always sorted, and at home, Georgina pushed Alicia to pursue her hobby of creating videos. She too had a dream of one day making it on YouTube. So today I'm going to show you all about pasta, such a Um, I'm going to be telling you all about pasta. So first of all, pasta is a food. Everyone knows that. And pasta is now made all over the world. This is a picture of pasta, which I don't know what kind of pasta. So you'll be happy to see it. I'm just going to show you around the book. This is the first day. And this is what this is. So it's better having fun with this. So um, this is the page that they both make a door. And this is the page that they really at. I'm going to show you some of the pages because I'm not sure about the pages. This is your last one and these are all the rinse the book you can put in pasta. So, guys, this is the end of my video showing you around this book and tell you stuff. And I hope you subscribe and tell me down below if you like this video, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Don't you forget to subscribe.
The young girl had a bright future ahead of her. Her teacher, Wendy Davy, had this to say. Alicia enjoyed reading and was a perfectionist when it came to her writing. She was a considerate child who loved being a part of a group and was popular among the students. Other teachers spoke of her being bright and bubbly, who would always come into class with a big, beautiful smile. But sadly, as the final bell rang for the summer of 2018, that would unfortunately be the last time any of her teachers would ever see her alive again. On the 28th of June, 2018, Alicia made her way over to Rothesay to spend three weeks with her father, her father's girlfriend, Tony McLachlan, and her grandparents. When she arrived, she wanted to go Highland dancing, but by the time they reached the club for the session, it had finished. Instead, a trip to Ettrick Bay Beach was arranged by her grandparents. She'd been to the beach many times before. It was one of her favorites. The day was eventful. It was like many others she had in the past, but as the day drew to an end, it was time to head back to the three-bedroom flat, where the family spent the rest of the night together. Over the next couple of days, the summer holiday would be packed full of fun. More days out were core memories that they'll cherish forever. One in particular was at Gala Day on the island. Callum, Alicia's grandfather, remembers Alicia going on rides, having the time of her life. Then came the 1st of July. That day too was packed full of emotions, ups and downs, but sadly this story doesn't end how we'd all like it to. And it was this day that would not only shake the small communities of Rothesay and Airdrie, rather the whole nation. The day starts off as follows. Everyone wakes up and shares breakfast together. Alicia's watching YouTube, doing the usual on her summer holiday morning, but today she's heading back to her hometown of Airdrie with her grandfather Callum to attend a friend's birthday party. Only problem is when they arrive, they're 24 hours late, but a birthday party is taking place at the venue in question. Hey Alicia, it's one of her friends, why don't you join me? So she joins and enjoys the day. Alicia had attended the party, although she didn't actually know the person whose birthday it was. But as she had mutual friends at the bash, the parents allowed her to stay after her and her grandfather made the 55 mile trip. The party was a blast, but eventually it was time to head back to the Isle of Butte. And on the drive back, Callum would share one final memory with Alicia that would stick with him until this very day. For the whole 55 mile trip, she would hit Callum on the back of the head with a balloon she had acquired from the party. When they reached a beach in Rothesay, she had attempted to do it again, but this time she let go and it blew off down the shoreline. Alicia chased it for a short while, but in the end it burst and the two shared a laugh. From here, Alicia was dropped into town to her father Robert and his girlfriend Tony, who spent a few hours with her down a local park before her grandma Angela collected the trio. They headed home but had passed a local supermarket to pick up some dinner. Upon arriving back home, food was made, put on the table, and ate. Everyone began to wind down, and at around 10pm, Alicia was taken to bed. Her favourite Peppa Pig DVD was put on the TV, but out of nowhere, 30 minutes later, she burst into her grandparents' room, gave them a big kiss and a cuddle before uttering the words, Good night, Grandpa. At around 11pm, Callum went to go and check on Alicia to make sure she'd fell asleep. She had done, so now he could go to bed and rest easy knowing that his granddaughter was sound asleep. This is our vlog. I'm just here to talk. Uh, I'm first going to start off with subscribers on YouTube. Um, I've fastly had a little breaking point in the middle of nine subscribers where I slowed down and didn't get very many subscribers, but now I'm fast getting subscribers. I'm already up at 21 within about a week. So from 9 to 16 within a week is quite good. Like, my dream is obviously to get the same amount of subscribers as PewDiePie, maybe Yogscaster Syndicate, just people like that. Um, also, don't worry guys, I'm not just doing Minecraft. Uh, other series is... Other series... series other series... It's plural. Other series will be on the way. Uh, grammar. Uh, it's just you need to remember that it's hard to get noticed on YouTube, and every little and every person that hit, clicks that subscribe button that helps a lot more than you think. Trust me. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, bye. See you guys later. And yeah, like. Why do I repeat things, guys? Why do I repeat things? So annoying. <laughs> oh, I cry. I cry. I cry for you. Yes, you look. There was tears coming from my eyes. I cry. I cry. This is the face of evil.
Although a young Aaron Campbell looks like he wouldn't hurt to fly here, in the years to come he would go on to commit one of, if not the most heinous crime in Scotland. There isn't much information out there detailing Aaron's life, other than the few bits of information that's widely available on the internet. If we rewind the clock back to the 7th of May 2002, Aaron Thomas Campbell was born in Shrewsbury, England, a distance from where he would eventually grow up. In 2007, his family relocated to the Isle of Bute, for reasons currently unknown. Details on his family life are conflicting also. On the one hand, some reports say that he suffered both emotional and physical abuse from his mother Jeanette while growing up. Others contest that. What we do know is that Aaron's father Christopher, a supervisor in the oil industry, had spent time away from the home quite frequently due to work. With just Aaron, his sister and mother in the house, some reports say that Aaron and Jeanette would constantly argue when she had one too many to drink. Disclaimer, she would drink quite often. In 2014, Aaron Campbell would start to post to YouTube. He had aspirations of becoming as big as PewDiePie one day, and what started off as gaming content in his early days of posting would turn into parkour and vlog style of videos as he grew older. His lifestyle would begin to change and his content match that. As he would go out more, he would film outside rather than stay inside on his computer, although he wanted to eventually go to university to study game design. Throughout his time at secondary school, he was described as being a well-liked teen with a large friend group. Not the usual stereotype of someone who would eventually go on to commit the type of crime he would go on to commit. But there was one small detail that I've left out that begins to paint a picture of what really ran through Aaron's mind, and although his friend group often brushed this off as him being a quote edgy teen, in hindsight that was definitely not the case. In 2017, a Facebook conversation between Aaron and a female friend of his took place about a true crime documentary. We don't know in-depth details about that conversation, other than he went on to say quote, I might kill one day for the lifetime experience. From the summer of 2017, by Aaron's own admission, he had spent roughly a year thinking about doing something excessive, including rape, and when that opportunity was handed to him, he took it. If we take Aaron's word of when he got to know Tony, we can get a rough estimate as to when the first domino falls in this story. He would later come out to say that he and Tony had been friends with benefits in the winter of 2017. This statement is believed to be false, however, and the relationship between the two was strictly business. The drugs business, that is. You see, Robert had sold cannabis to people in the local area. It wasn't a big operation, rather to support his own habit. Tony was in on it too. And with Aaron being the outgoing person he was at this point, also dabbling in drugs and alcohol, it's not surprising that the two crossed paths. The relationship between both parties would turn sour in February of 2018, however, after Aaron complained that the quality of Robert's product was poor, and so Aaron never paid the £10 debt that he owed to Robert. Robert. So this is where the story starts to come full circle, and believe it or not, for months, Aaron and Robert never crossed paths, although there was one occasion in where Aaron had almost crossed paths with Alicia and her grandparents. As you know, when Alicia arrived in the Isle of Butte on the 28th of June 2018, the trio attended Ettrick Bay Beach. Well, it was only two days later that Aaron, celebrating that the school year was complete, had also attended the beach to go camping with some friends. It was here a plan was thrown together to throw a house party at his seven-bedroom room house the following day on the 1st of July. The party went ahead, 15 friends were invited over, and overall it had been good vibes. Aaron had drank a bottle of Mad Dog Fortified Wine, and she had a bottle of Echo Falls wine with a friend. I got drunk, Aaron recalls. I wasn't sick, I was just having a good time. However, as the party drew to a close at around 12.30am on July 2nd, Aaron's mood changed after arguing with his mum for the majority of the night. Everyone had left the party, but one friend had to go back because he forgot his bag. Upon arriving, he remembers finding Aaron in an emotional state, and recalled he felt suicidal. The friend stayed with Aaron for a while because he felt worried, but this friend had managed to get Aaron's spirits back up. I'm gonna go and get some weed, then head off to bed. Thanks for everything, mate. And the two parties went their separate ways. The friend, back home to his bed, for Aaron to source out some cannabis and do the same thing. In a drunken state, he was going to contact Robert to see if he had any weed on him, but didn't bother pestering him because he remembered that he owed him money. So he thought he'd try to ring Tony instead, but she didn't respond. In fact, Aaron had attempted to message various drug dealers to find some drugs, but because it was late, everyone was asleep. For some reason, again, more than likely because he was drunk, he hatched a plan in where he wanted to steal some cannabis from Robert instead. He had already robbed him once anyway, even if it wasn't necessarily to his face, 
so why not do it again? And so he crept downstairs, took a knife from the kitchen, and headed over to Roberts to steal this cannabis stash. He was captured on CCTV at around 1.54am on the 2nd of July 2018, making his way towards Roberts to execute this plan. When he arrived a short while later, the door had been unlocked. He didn't even have to break in. He just walked in. The cannabis was about to be his in a matter of moments. Maybe, just maybe then, he didn't even have to bring the knife after all. Well, that isn't exactly what happened. You see, it was true everyone was sleeping, and his initial plan was to steal this cannabis stash. But as he was looking around the house for it, he came across little Alicia sleeping in bed. Her bedroom was the closest to the front door. Now, instead of thinking to himself, Self. I better back away, she's a child. He saw this as the perfect opportunity to act on dark thoughts that had ran through his head. It was a moment of opportunity. All I thought about was killing her once I saw her. So the initial plan was scrapped and Aaron scooped Alicia up out of bed in the dead of night, right from under the supervision of her grandparents, her father and her father's girlfriend. She was described as being in a deep sleep when leaving the property itself, but had woke slightly from the cold breeze when outside. She wasn't panicked though. Who are you? Where are we going? Shush, shush now. I'm your dad's friend. I'm taking you home. I'm cold. Hold on. Here's my jacket. Although Aaron's small gesture of gifting Alicia his jacket might seem nice, in reality, it was to give her a false sense of security. We don't know if Alicia fell back asleep, but she certainly didn't put up a fight. She was just as six after all. It's not like she would have been aware of what was going on. Over the space of the next 30 minutes, they made their way down the coastline out of public view. Around here is where Aaron disposed of his knife, and around here, the pair were captured on home surveillance footage. Although that footage hasn't been released to the public, Public. The journey would continue down the coastline until they reached a wooded area and onto the land which surrounded the then at the time abandoned Kauza Butte hydropathic hotel. When arriving at the hotel grounds, Aaron raped Alicia before going on to murder her via significant forceful pressure to her neck and face. She ended up with 117 separate injuries, mostly scratches and abrasions, but some of her injuries from the rape are too horrific that I don't even want to mention them in this video. After leaving Alicia's lifeless, vulnerable, naked body on the grounds of the hotel, Aaron left the scene and made his way back to the coastline. From here, he made his way home, and at roughly 3.35 a.m., he picked up on his home surveillance camera jumping over a wall. Ten minutes later, at 3.45am, he spotted once again, leaving the property wearing only shorts and carrying clothes. He sprinted when outside his gate. He would make his way back to the coastline and dump the clothes in the ocean. When he returned seven minutes later, he was spotted wearing only shorts. He climbed over a wall and went back into his home. The clothes he was carrying have disappeared. Of course, he disposed of them in the sea.
Six minutes later, he spotted once again, sprinting out of the house having changed clothes and carrying what looked like a torch. Then at 4.07am, he returned to his house for a final time. At roughly 6am on the 2nd of July 2018, Callum McPhail woke up for work. He went to go and check on Alicia to make sure everything was okay, but when he did, she wasn't there. He frantically began searching around her bedroom, and when he couldn't find her, he woke the flat up to aid in the search. The family soon realised that Alicia was missing. Her bike was still in the garden, she had never run away before, so they were scratching their heads as to how this could have happened. A 999 call was placed at around 6.23am. The family were now fully awake and out of the house searching for the little girl. Angela had posted a Facebook appeal for everyone in the local area to keep an eye out for Alicia and to report back if anyone knew of her whereabouts. Sadly, this is how Alicia's mother would find out that she was missing. She never received a call from anyone. Not even the police informed her. Over the next two and a half hours, tens of residents were in the streets looking far and wide, the police too. Even the Coast Guard and helicopter units came out to assist in the search. And at around 6.55am, the first piece of evidence was found. The knife Aaron had discarded was found by the Coast Guard on the shoreline. As the call was being placed to police at around 6.23am, Tony had attempted to call none other than Aaron Campbell. Remember, he tried to call her a few times hours earlier in search of cannabis. At 9.01am, she got this response from him. Sorry, doesn't matter. A small conversation then ensued. Want to keep an eye out for Rab's wee girl, please? Yeah, what's happened? She's went missing from house. Police are looking for her and helicopter is out. Oh damn, I'm sure she's not went too far. Hopefully. Aaron Campbell thought he had pulled the wool over everyone's eyes and had probably thought that his dark secret would never be brought to light. Well, he was wrong. As that text message exchange was underway, police had only moments before been informed by a member of the public that they had found Alicia on the grounds of the hotel. Her family were informed a short while later. Initially, no arrests were made in relation to the investigation, but maximum police resources were put into it. Multiple officers patrolled the streets. Parts of the Isle of Buttes were completely cordoned off, and even more officers participated in door-to-door -door inquiries. So whoever the perpetrator was, it wasn't going to be a long time before they were caught, hopefully. Police Scotland had put out multiple appeals on social media for anyone to come forward, and that's when one woman, Jeanette Campbell, Aaron's mother, came forward with CCTV footage of Aaron moving suspiciously on the night Alicia was abducted, raped and murdered. Jeanette spoke to Aaron about his movements on that night and wanted police to rule him out as a suspect. She had a lengthy chat with him before handing the footage over to police and had asked if he knew any information about the case or even worse, had committed the offence. He was adamant he had nothing to do with any of it and said he didn't know anyone who could have potentially been the perpetrator. She warned him that the DNA evidence would be found by police, so if he was lying, he'd be caught out anyway when police take him in for questioning. Still, he remained calm and collected, told his mother he knew nothing, and she came forward to police with evidence. Aaron Campbell was first brought in for questioning as a potential witness. Detectives say he answered all questions put forward to him. He remained calm and didn't act suspiciously when they spoke to him. However, by the 4th of July, with extra evidence brought forward, he would be brought in again as a suspect, with new evidence pinpointing him to the crime. And what a surprise, his whole demeanour changed, and he began to give no comment answers to police. Various pieces of evidence had came forward via CCTV, DNA, and even phone data analysis. On the day after the murder, Aaron had searched, collecting DNA evidence on his phone, and had also posted a sinister Snapchat to a group of people. In the snap, he posted a picture of him pointing at himself in the mirror with the caption, found the guy who'd done it. It's not hard to see then why police ended up charging him in relation to the investigation. Aaron Campbell would go on to deny the charges that were brought against him and logged what's being quoted as a special defense of incrimination. In other words, he tried to argue that Tony was responsible for Alicia's death. In court, he took to the witness stand and claimed 
he had sexual intercourse with Tony in a garage on the night in question, suggesting that she murdered Alicia and used a condom to plant his semen on Alicia's body. Aaron's lawyers asserted that Tony was jealous of the attention Alicia received from the family and more specifically of Robert. Aaron Campbell answered questions for about two hours, offering explanations for the prosecution's evidence while appearing unfazed according to a journalist within the courtroom. But if you didn't guess it by now, the jury saw straight through his lies and after only three hours of deliberation, they found Aaron Campbell guilty of the abduction, rape and murder of six-year-old Alicia McPhail on the 21st of February 2019. Aaron remained emotionless as the guilty verdict was given. A sentencing hearing was then set for the 21st of March 2019, and within that time, Aaron had finally confessed to his crime to Dr. Gary McPherson, a consultant forensic clinical psychologist and social worker. He revealed that Aaron told him that he was, quote, quite satisfied with the murder and said it took, quote, everything to stop laughing during points of the trial, adding, quote, he had to zip his mouth shut. Dr. McPherson's report that was eventually given to the judge before sentencing also stated that Aaron at that point had, quote, continued to experience thoughts of killing and having sex with children and having sex with dead bodies. In Scotland, people who commit crimes under the age of 18, by law, have to have their names hidden from the public domain, unless a judge feels like it's in the best interest of the public that their name is out there. Normally, news organisations have to lodge some kind of appeal for their name to be released, and in Aaron's case, his name went public even though he was under the age of 18 at the time. Aaron Thomas Campbell, <coughs> you were found guilty of the abduction, rape and murder of Alicia McPhail, a six-year-old child. Merely stating that fact is horrific enough, but the circumstances surrounding these vile crimes and the manner of their commission have quite rightly aroused revulsion and disbelief that these sorts of things could happen. Alicia had just arrived on Butte to spend a holiday with her father and grandparents and had gone to bed apparently safe in her own room. No doubt she was looking forward to what the next few weeks had in store. Her father and his parents would have enjoyed every minute of it, while her mother and her family would have been counting down the days till they saw her smiling face again. Meanwhile, you attended a party at your own home, consumed alcohol, and then, on your account, to which I will return, went off in search of cannabis. You went into the house and then her bedroom. You removed her from there and took her to a secluded spot where you violated and murdered her in the most brutal fashion. The details of that were revealed in the evidence and I do not intend to go over them again. It is difficult to imagine the distress which your family must have suffered not only when she went missing, but when the awful news came in that she had been found dead. That distress can only have been intensified, if that was possible, by their finding out the extent of what you did to her, not only in the weeks and months immediately afterwards, but in the course of the trial. I have read statements by her parents and grandparents in which they have tried to express their loss and the emptiness which greets them every day. Just as I know that no sentence which I can pass will alleviate their anguish, so I know that mere words are poor reflections of it. The effect on the island community was profound. Many of them rallied round to help in the search, and the effect on those who saw Alicia in the woods will be long-lasting. I have never before seen a police officer almost break down in the witness box, so affected was he by the sight. The contrast between them and you could not be more vivid. Your attitude was clearly demonstrated by the evidence that you posted an image of yourself in a mirror while making a joke that you had found where the murderer was hiding. The arrogance and callousness of that is breathtaking. Thanks to the dedication of the police and forensic scientists, ably assisted by members of the public, such as those who came forward when they found articles of your clothing on the shore, you were eventually brought to justice. Despite the overwhelming evidence against you, you did not plead guilty but elected to go to trial. That was your right, and I do not increase your sentence because of it. However, it is symptomatic of your staggering lack of remorse. Not once during the trial did I detect a flicker of emotion from you, and that was also the experience of the professionals who interviewed you for the purposes of the reports, to which I will turn shortly. 
De your defence was one of incrimination of a young woman, Tony Louise McLaughlin, and you gave evidence in support of it. It was a cruel travesty of the truth, which was understandably reported widely in the media and left her open to suspicion at the very least and quite possibly hatred, all of which was due to your perverted machinations. I am very grateful to Mr McConaughey, who today made it clear that she was completely innocent. Mr McConaughey has said all that could be said on your behalf, entirely in keeping with the exemplary way the trial was conducted on both sides of the bar. All matters of fact which could reasonably be agreed were agreed, and the issues were well focused and laid before the jury. As I said to the jury after they returned their verdict, counsel do not make up defences, but present the case on the basis of their instructions. It is obvious what your instructions were, and your evidence was entirely in keeping with them, albeit it was a tissue of lies. It does not go too far, therefore, when I say that I was shocked when I saw the contents of the Criminal Justice Social Work Report and the report from Dr McPherson, the consultant forensic clinical psychologist. Each of these reports contains clear admissions by you of your guilt. Not only that, and this is a terrible thing to say of one so young, but they paint a clear picture of a cold, callous, calculating, remorseless and dangerous individual. I do not intend to go into every detail of the reports or of your admissions, since much of it would, I think, be distressing, and much of it merely confirms some of the evidence which was led. However, I think it right that the public, and more particularly her family, be given some flavour of the contents. Dr McPherson noted that you presented your account in a matter-of-fact manner, notable for the absence of any emotions. He recorded that you told him that in the 12 months prior to the murder, you entertained thoughts of doing something excessive, including rape. Your account, in brief, was that you had been drinking but wanted cannabis and decided to break into the house to get some. You took a kitchen knife because you wanted to protect yourself, but having gained entry, you left the house and disposed of it. You returned to the house and entered Alicia's bedroom. Amongst other things, Dr McPherson records that you told him that you had consumed one and a half bottles of wine between 8 o'clock and 8.30, but that you did not feel intoxicated, although you told the social worker that you still felt the effects of it. You were not under the influence of any illicit substances. He records that when you saw Alicia, your reaction, according to you, was as follows, and I quote, a moment of opportunity. At any other time in life, murder wouldn't have been the conclusion. If I was a year younger, I don't think I would have done it. All I thought about was killing her once I saw her. You told both Dr McPherson and the social worker in some detail what you did. You said that Alicia was drowsy and became a bit more awake when you went outside. At one point she asked who you were and where you were going. You said you were a friend of her father's and that you were taking her home. You gave her your top because she was cold. I will not go into the horrific and cold-blooded details of what you said you did to her, but you explained that after you murdered Alicia, you threw your bloodstained clothing into the sea, had a shower, and then went back where you left her to retrieve your phone. Dr McPherson reports that you told him that over the next few days you were totally unconcerned, other than to be mildly amused that the police had not arrested you. Two other aspects of his report are worth mentioning. The first is that you told him that at points during the trial it took everything to stop you laughing and you had to zip your mouth. The second is that you volunteered that you were quite satisfied with the murder. According to all of the reports, you are not suffering from any mental health disorder and indeed you are not suffering from any syndrome or disorder of any kind. On the other hand, you are completely lacking in victim empathy, the social worker noting your cold, calculating manner. The only sentence I can impose on you is detention without limit of time. In addition, you will be subject to the notification provisions of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 for an indefinite period. However, I also have to specify a period which must pass before you can apply for release on parole. 
Whether you will ever be released will be for others to determine. But as matters stand, a lot of work will have to be done to change you before that could be considered. It may even be impossible. The period I select is known as the punishment part of the sentence, and its purpose is to satisfy the requirements of retribution and deterrence. The parole board will deal in due course with the protection of the public. I have taken account of the circumstances of the offences, the contents of the reports, and everything said on your behalf. I am conscious that you are a child. In sentencing children, it has to be borne in mind that they are not yet fully rounded, mature human beings. A child's best interests are a primary consideration, and the desirability of the child's reintegration into society must also be taken into account. However, the weight to be given to the various sentencing considerations will depend on a number of factors, including the age of the child and all the circumstances of the case. The nature of these appalling offences and what I have read in the reports make it clear to me that reintegration and rehabilitation, while these are important considerations, are remote possibilities, and neither your best interests nor anyone else's will be served by a speedy return to the community. Nonetheless, the punishment part will not be as long as it would have been had you been an adult. Your sentence will run from 6 July 2018. You will be detained without limit of time and I fix the punishment part at 27 years. Is all. So Aaron Campbell was jailed for 27 years, but later on in 2019, he went for an appeal hearing and the judge knocked three years off that sentence. To sum up, the appeal judge handed a new sentence of 24 years because he felt that 27 years would be more applicable for an adult rather than a child, which at that point, Aaron was. Fast forwarding to 2022 then, and over these past few years, Aaron hasn't been holding up that great in jail to say the least. Reports from late 2019 state that his family have completely disowned him, with his mother Jeanette scared to visit prison in case she's attacked herself. She'd been visiting prison while he was on remand when his name wasn't public, but to my best knowledge, no one since his name has gone public has visited him. Then, only a couple months back from when I'm recording this video, reports emerged that prison justice had been served when Aaron Campbell was hospitalised following a brutal beating at the Polmount Young Offenders Institute. According to prison sources, Aaron has been a number one target for prisoners since his sentencing and therefore has been too scared to leave his cell. While no one has forgotten about his crime and one day in June of 2022, his cell door was left slightly open during mealtime. One fellow prisoner then burst through the door, put Aaron through the beating of a lifetime. It was that bad the guard had to pull the inmate off him. Aaron was rushed to hospital after his tooth penetrated through his lip.